to Deadlands Dime Novels, The Adventures of Young and Holt, Issue 48, Meets and Treats. I'm your narrator, Ernest Wick, intrepid reporter for the Tombstone Epitaph. In this issue, Young and Holt are about to get themselves set up in Denver as they begin their hunt for Samuel Reddington. But first, it's time to make some discreet connections and maybe get some tobacco and chocolate. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so we best see where they're at. Forty minutes uh, before you find uh, a Moose Street, and then B the dry goods store, just because of the various activities and things going on here. But sure enough, there is a, uh, a storefront, and it's got that big false kind of flat front out there. It says Moose Street Dry Goods, and little half arc kind of uh, thing above the uh, above the entrance. And there's the porch, and it's got a couple barrels out front, a couple little hay bales as well. There's uh, uh, somebody out there, a little boy, sweeping, getting the dirt off the, the porch. Uh, and people are indeed going in and out of the, uh, of the store. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> uh, uh, let's just... Hope we don't get run out of this town, right? Oh, we have a long way to run. It's enormous. <sighs> got nobody to buy a dress for yet, Porter. <laughs> too soon, man. Too soon. I don't know. We're going to be meeting Jasmine. Do I have to buy a dress for her, too? You might not be able to afford a dress for her. No. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised. We have quite <laughs> a bit of money right now on us. <laughs> Okay. All right. Stepping into the dry goods Let's store. Step into the dry goods. A nice welcoming bell jingles as you walk through the store. It's fairly spacious in here, but the shelves um, are indeed tight together. You can certainly walk, you know, straight down the shelf, but you would absolutely have to turn to your side to give space if someone was coming from the other side. But you can see there's a variety of uh, goods to be had here uh, as well. And of course, yes, there are glass jars with various candies up at the front counter as well. One time. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for pipe tobacco, but when we pass by the candies, I'll uh, nudge Porter a little bit. And Porter just rolls his head and eyes like, oh, come on. <laughs> Uh, there is indeed uh, pipe tobacco. It's in some uh, s stepped shelves behind the uh, behind the counter. There's a woman uh, behind the counter as well. She's uh, smartly dressed. You know, it's practical clothing, but she looks very nice. Hair's all up and tight in there. She smiles at you, gentlemen. Miss, what we be looking for today? <laughs> Some pipe tobacco for me and some candy for the kit. I mean, Porter. Help yourself to the candy there, sir. Uh, by all means, uh, take a look. We just actually got a recent shipment in uh, not but two days ago. There's some uh, some, some fine choices there. Um, I'm kind of partial to the, uh, the butterscotch myself, but you help yourself with whatever. Half a pound will run you a penny. Uh, as far as the tobacco, uh, we've got uh, a good selection here. We've got uh, some, uh, uh, we have both North and South Carolina. It uh, depends what your preference is with that. And then uh, this over here, and she taps the box here. This is some uh, uh, fine Virginian. And down here, uh, this comes uh, around Atlanta way. I give a few of them a, a nice sniff. You know, she'll she put it out there so you could take a yeah you know, take a, a good gander and inspection. Uh, each one of them will run you a, a quarter for uh, a pound. The ones from outside Atlanta, that's actually going to be thirty cents. I'll take a pound for the Atlanta. All right, excellent. Do you got a pouch, or do you need me to bag this here for you? 
Yep, I'll pull out the buffalo skin pouch that's uh, empty now and uh, refill it. All right. Yeah, she'll scoop it in there and uh, she'll take your uh, take your money uh, easily enough. It's my kind of you. Thank you, sir. So I'm double checking. Is there chocolate? That is a really, really good question. Um... So I... I immediately went back and I said, 1854 was the first package box of Whitman's chocolate. We're in 1877, so I'm sure there is absolutely chocolate. So Cadbury says, and Cadbury introduced the first Valentine's Day box of chocolate in 68. So there should probably be some chocolate. Yeah, it's probably uh, in, yeah, like, you know, the good thick bar form of some sort. Yeah, I'm going to... Yeah, Porter's going to pick out some... He's going to actually make a nice detour, a big loop right around the licorice. Because I maybe Josh hasn't picked up on this, but the smell of it nauseates him now. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> hence the reason he keeps putting it out there. Uh, so that's awesome. He'd rather uh, talk about that than something redheaded. And goes for uh, the chocolate instead. And he'll come back with some of that and put it on the counter. If nothing else, they might have like the uh, chunk cooking chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, um, oh my goodness, some of these images for chocolate. I Googled chocolate in the 1800s and some of the images are fantastic. I love it. (laughs) Now I have to Yes, it's it's great. there's, uh, There's a great Cadbury's one. Yeah, Porter, yeah, you easily can get uh, a couple of bars that you probably can get two. There, chocolate here definitely is going to be expensive, but you can get uh, you can That's get fine. a couple of good bars for a dollar. They look deliciously sweet. They're deliciously sweet. And they better. Uh, and then I'm going to look to Joshua and be like, are you going to? Sure. So, Molly, she, her eyes slide to you. I don't believe we've been uh, formally introduced. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Miss London? Make me a, uh, make me a notice check when you say that, Joshua. Actually, Porter, you can do it as well, now that I think about it. Since I'm assuming you're standing there as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm not infatuated with the chocolate yet. I got a four. Okay. Ha! Once again, when it comes to Whitman, Joshua is oblivious. <laughs> so Joshua got a three, Porter got a four. All right. So when you say Miss London or Mrs. London to her, Porter, you notice that because her eyes had already kind of slid a little suspiciously to Joshua. And then when she said Mrs. London, you notice that. Her um, left hand, when she has this pendant that she was wearing around her neck, and her left hand goes um, to the pendant in a gesture that, you know, almost as if, almost as if she's, you know, like who me, but you can tell that she has she has gripped the thing that was on the end of her chain, the pendant. Uh, in a, in such a way that seems somewhat suspicious, and her right hand has lowered below the counter. So Joshua says, uh, "Mrs. London," she says, "Now I'm definitely sure that we have not been formally introduced, sir, and, and you seem to have me at a bit of a uh, disadvantage." <laughs> My apologies. Would you have any dried henbit? Henbit, I see. Um, I don't know. We don't normally serve henbit here without. Um, proper identification might you have that upon you joshua will slowly (laughs) reach in past his saddlebag that he's still got slung over his shoulder underneath the trench underneath his vest and into the vest pocket and uh, pull out the leather wallet uh and you're gonna flip open the or show her the badge inside no he'll just slide it across the counter her left hand stays clutching her pendant, but her right hand comes up and you may both make another notice check while she does this as she as she goes to open up the, the billfold. Ha! Porter's jumpy. 
Porter's <laughs> super jumpy after watching your hand disappear beneath the counter. Porter is very jumpy. Joshua is still just, hey, whatever, man. Joshua's waiting on the shotgun to be leveled at him. I mean, come on. It's a new town. It hasn't happened yet. This is her right hand, and she wears, uh, she has two rings on her hand, Porter. Uh, one on her index finger, one on her ring finger. And as you notice, as she goes to open the billfold, um, there is just the, the, the slightest hint of a reddish glow um, to both of those uh, rings that she has in there. But she flips it, the billfold open, and she sees the, the badge. And her left hand comes down off of her pendant, and she folds it back up and pushes it towards you. Why, yes, well, we do have some uh, hand bit. And she looks over at Porter. Is there uh, anything you're looking for um, at all? Well, I was hoping that you had some chocolate in the shape of a heart. And I'll put, I'll just show mine. You show it to her right up, right well. up front? I'll keep it in front of my chest so that no one else can look from the side. Excellent. She um, nods, I believe we do. I believe we do, gentlemen. If uh, you would follow me, I'll take you right back there. Pick up the wallet off the counter and put it away. And I'll follow Porter down. She takes you to the back of the store and to the, where the back door is. And you can see through the glass there's essentially like a backyard uh, of sorts here. You can't make up much details. But she opens the door and she says, he's, uh, he's right out here. Thank you, ma'am. Of course, of course. And she closes the door behind uh, as you step outside and down the steps. You find yourselves uh, indeed in a kind of a fenced-in backyard area. It's a closed line here. It all looks fairly mundane. There's a dude back here. He's uh, chopping wood at the moment uh, to break some stuff down. There's a, a place where it's being stacked. It looks like there's maybe a couple of sheds back here. There's a dog who's kind of casually roaming around uh, in this yard as well. And, as the axe comes down and splits another log uh, in two and the two pieces go flipping out. Uh, this guy turns around and he leaves the axe stuck in the, uh, in the stump. His shirt's like half open and you know sleeves are rolled up and whatnot. So he's showing the, off. The wind is slightly <laughs> yeah. blowing through his long hair. <laughs> The wind, yes, and then his 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 chest hair majestically flows out of his shirt as well. No, but he uh, he takes a rag and kind of wipes off uh, his hands and his face and walks up, hen bit and heart. That's correct. Excellent, excellent. Real true pleasure to meet you, uh, Alexander London. He comes forth and extends a hand. You can see he's older as well. He's he might be close to your age, Joshua. He may not look as old as you do just because, you know, various things, but he he definitely is older. But he will uh, he will shake each of your hand in turn if you'll let him. Oh, absolutely. I'll shake his hand first. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, you as well. You as well. Both of you. Excellent. I got the message, uh, uh, telegram from uh, Minneapolis saying that uh, the two of you might be coming and uh, I'm glad to have you both here. Glad to have you both here. Uh, uh, did you just get into town? Just got off the train. Oh, well, right down to business. Excellent. Well, uh, can I get you anything? Are you hungry at all? Thirsty? Uh, you might be able to suggest a good hotel to stay in. Something where we can keep an eye out. Actually, the, uh, the agency has got uh, rooms available for agents at uh, all of the, well, the mid-range establishments and the Oxford. Uh, but yeah, I can get your rooms at the Crescent View, Rocky Rest, Spanish Delight. Uh, I, uh, I probably, I think the room at the Oxford should be available as well if you're looking for uh, a bit of a uh, higher end stay. Although he he kind of looks more at, at or is Joshua wearing his suit now, or is he still in his? Uh, Joshua's got old worn boots, old worn hat, but he's got suit, vest, and pants looking nice with kind of the, the rugged long coat over the top of it that's seen better days. Okay. He uh, he looks the two of you up and down. He says, you're a little bit underdressed, at least on the outside there, for uh, 
uh, for the Oxford, but I think we could probably could get you. And he's specifically just pointing at uh, at Joshua. I think we could we could get you in there if you'd so choose. It's a nice place. Uh, the reporter sort of hits Joshua in the chest with the back of his hand. See, a good suit gets you places. That it does. That it does. Are you two been? Uh... If I wear a coat, it's going to have to be cut a little looser than yours. I can't help it. You're a little uh, not proud of your figure. Uh. And I'll just kind of tap one side of my chest. Oh, well, yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> and it's got to fit over my long johns. Oh yeah. You you let you let me know, and I'll I'll get that set up for you. I'm happy to do that. Happy to do that. Glad to see we got some uh, uh, agents. Once I retired, they uh, the agency kind of sought me out, but. Uh, uh, I've been happy to do some work for them. I try not to get my hands too dirty anymore. I've uh, I got other priorities. And he he looks past you, you know, towards the uh, uh, towards the store. You best keep that priority safe. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll do the best we can to not draw any undue attention your way. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I do understand, you know. Uh, he looks around a little bit. I do understand the importance of the big picture and also, you know, worse comes to worse. He says, uh, pats his chest, you, you can count on me. But uh, what, can I, what, can I, what can I do you for? What, uh, what do you need to know? Uh, two things. The first one, I, wait, what do you think about the Rocky Rest, Joshua? Rocky Rest. It sounds like the uh, restful nights you and I have had on the trail. Yeah. The Rocky Rest is a nice place, um, for sure. If you um, if you spend most of your time uh, laying on the land, so to speak, I can guarantee you that the the beds there will be a, a, a welcome a respite from that, for sure. Uh, and then I guess technically two question, two more questions. The first is, do you have any news on um, him? Yes. On our subject, yes. absolutely. Let me uh, let me get you caught up on what I need to know. Uh, as he's saying that, um, Molly comes out and she has a uh, a tray. It's got uh, three lemonades on it. Oh, he grabs one and she offers the the tray to the two of you. Uh, you can just see Porter just like he's like looking at it and how cold it looks and how delicious it looks and he's just. Oh, it's good. And he takes a he takes a long pull. Yeah, Joshua will grab one and take a big drink, too. No, thank you, ma'am. Porter, you're turning him down? Yes. She looks and Molly says, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. All right. She goes, takes it back in. Alexander London watches uh, her leave, and and he says, that woman there, she is... Uh, uh, She's nasty in a fight. Let me just tell you, and I don't mean like a fight between husband and wife. I said she's got uh, she's got a few tricks up her sleeve that she'll uh, definitely give anyone who challenges her a run for their money. I think that's one of the things I like about her. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, he sets his glass down. So our subject, yes, um, is is there a table or chairs or anything nearby? There are a couple of uh, chairs, or at least there's a couple of stumps where you can all sit here. I'll grab a piece of wood that he hasn't chopped, flip it over so that Porter can sit down, and I'll do the same for myself. All right. Yeah, and I'm going to pull out my uh, notebook. He uh, he gets himself comfortable. So, I can tell you that I am absolutely fairly certain that he is here. And I say this only because a man that matches his clothing description has absolutely been spotted. The... Uh, the long white coat, uh, the dominoes in hand, and all that coat might be dirty here, depending upon, you know. But here, though, actually, it, it's been noticed that it's fairly clean. The, uh, the, the reason why I say that is because, and I didn't read the full details of the report, only to know that he was, uh, if I remember correctly, he was shot in the, in the head, in the back of the head. Is that, is that right? Yeah, his uh, skull got laid open quite right. In the head, and he's still walking. Yeah, two uh, two slugs 
Shotgun. Sorry, sorry. No, no. He's uh, he's clearly he's a he's a tough son bitch. So, kind of reminds me of another fellow with the uh, railroad. But I only hit him once. Sometimes it's all it takes. Sorry. No, no. That's that's all right. It's all right. Um, well, then that uh, that tracks then with uh, with what I saw because this uh, individual, let's just say it's uh, our Mister Reddington, his hair is absent. And uh, he's uh, was seen in his, his clothing with a, uh, a tan-colored skull cap uh, and bandages around uh, his face. Although it, the bandages seem to frame uh, a pair of goggles. Now, according to what uh, my wife Molly said there, that those goggles were just simply goggles. There's nothing. He he looks at the the ones on your hat. Does, they don't appear as fanciful as those uh, that you've got on your hat there, mister. But anyway, so that's apparently what he looks like now. Uh, still got the white coat, still got the dominoes, but more bandages on his face and uh, some bizarre cult skull cap on his head. Another agent reported that they saw uh, Mr. Reddington head into the back room of Round Eye Royce's smithy. Now, Rondi Royce, he's been a smithy in these parts for quite some time. Uh, he's hes pretty well known to work with Ghost Rock, has even made a few items uh, out of that ghost steel uh, as well. So, now, does uh, does uh, Roundi, does he um, cavort with people of their organization? I think, he, uh, I think he just simply does business with them. I don't think that he is a member of that organization. But I don't know that. Now, Mr. Uh, Reddington well, has also been seen having dinner at the Julian with at least uh, two men, two women. Now, here's where we get here's where it gets a little interesting. Uh, the owner of the Julian, who also owns the Oxford as well, is known as Adolf Zhang. Uh, actually, he's a he's a friend of uh, our mutual associate out in Minneapolis. But anyway. Um, that's, I guess, beside the, that's aside, beside the point. But, however, the two men, two women that he was with, I got some names for you on those. Uh, unfortunately, this, this, I, if you're taking, he looks at you, Porter, taking notes. I'm going to do my best as far as uh, pronunciation and spelling, because these are, uh, both these folks are from uh, overseas, uh, over in Europe, across the pond. That's fine. We've got uh, uh, Corulius and Teal. Uh, their last name is Sakes, and I believe that's S A X E. Wait, how did you, what was the first name? Yeah, that's what I thought. Carulius, I believe, is how it's pronounced. They're Spaniards, I believe. Carulius, what was Antiel? Did you say? Teal was uh, is uh, yes, I, and I, be, I I do not know if they are husband and wife, but they behave as such, so it would seem to me. And the uh, the second pair, uh, they go by the names of. Uh, Flavio and Amber. Last name is uh, Latuez. I believe they are Italian. Now, fortunately, I don't know too much about them other than uh, the fact that they're European and that they were uh, seen with uh, uh, our Mr. Reddington. However, I do believe that they are all part of the same organization. And Reddington... And uh, some of his uh, other associates, we believe that they have been gathering supplies and storing them on the edge of town in uh, uh, Barton's stable. That's on the uh, far west side of town. Now you're welcome to go and check that out, but it looks like it's under a little bit of uh, guardianship. There's a group of former Confederate uh, soldiers. They act as mercenaries now. <clears throat> I believe they've been hired by Reddington and uh, the people he was at dinner with uh, to protect whatever it is that they're gathering together at Barton's. <sighs> okay. I think I got all that. Okay. Last thing. Now, like I know, I said that um, uh, Molly and I, of course, were willing to help uh, should the need arise, but if you decide, and we'll leave this up to you and your decision making process you decide that you need some additional hands, supports, guns, 
uh, personnel. Um, I can take care of that for you. I can I can round up some uh, I can round up some people for you. We'll bear that in mind. Oh, thank you. That's very helpful. Porter flips the page in his notebook. Ah, oh, of course. Eh, I try to do what I can. I take my job very seriously. Now I have one more question. What do you know about Jasmine Watibi? She is supposedly the socialite who's got the um, got a, a little getaway, a little cabin in uh, in that valley. Now, um, if I remember correctly, yeah, Jasmine. Uh, yeah, she's a rich one. That one. She's uh, she's got a, a permanent residence of sorts at the uh, Brown Palace. That's a real fancy hotel you saw coming in there. Is there stories, rumors about her? Anything? Other than the fact that she does enjoy play cards every now and again? Not really. She uh, she has more than a number of uh, gentlemen callers who seem to like to come and pay her a visit. But with Jasmine, it's hard to tell if they're there to do professional business or personal business. So, uh, but beyond that, not, I don't know that, uh, that much. I can certainly, uh, put a couple agents on her to keep tabs on her if you'd like. Uh, no, I don't think you need to. Um, we'll figure it out as we go. Fair enough. You can, uh, you can talk to either me or Molly. You don't feel the need to, uh, check in with me every time if you've got a request or something to report. Uh, Molly's more than capable of uh, getting things uh, taken care of. Let's see. So Porter is flipping through his notes, looking. It's like, oh, um, how about Zig Waller, Professor? Hmm. Zig Waller. Now that name does not sound familiar to me. Um, hold on, hold on. He gets up and runs to the back door and opens it up, shouts inside, comes back out. He goes, I, I, that's name not familiar, but you said professor, so let me uh, let me ask Molly. That's 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 her that's her realm. After about ten seconds, Molly comes out and he says, Molly, there. Uh, uh, he points over here. Uh, he's looking for uh, Professor Zig Waller. Does that uh, name sound familiar to you at all? Molly stands there. She thinks for a minute, kind of rubs her chin, and uh, you know. No, it doesn't. Which tells me, if he doesn't run in the circles that I run in, then he must be a different kind of professor, not uh, not one of the new sciences. I'm uh, I'm thinking he might be maybe a natural science professor of some sort, perhaps. Uh, maybe he might be a teacher at uh, one of the academies. Um, I'll, I'll I can put a couple uh, feelers out for him. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, he doesn't deal in anything that uh, the new science nature. Otherwise, I probably would know who he is, unless he's new. If I had to guess, he'd be of, as you say, the natural sciences, perhaps history, um, or perhaps archaeology, or something of that nature. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, and that would make. I guess that would that would make some sense. That would track with um, the fact that uh, yeah, there's there's plenty of. Uh, uh, of those folk who have been in and around here looking for, uh, you know, all manner of native artifacts or checking the mountains or the caves, you know, for signs from the past and whatnot. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll see what I can find out. Oh, sorry. I, 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 well, you make it quick because uh, Miss, Mrs. Henderson just came in and she's always a difficult customer. What? Well, go ahead. If you have any information uh, of even just his location, that would I'd be extremely grateful. Oh, of course, of course, absolutely. And the last question I would have for you, Mr. London, is when he moves, how many men does he usually have with him? I know when he was moving around Deadwood, he was he had a single man. <clears throat> uh, that's actually that's varied quite a bit. I've seen him, um, or I've had reports of him uh, uh, going moving solo. Uh, moving with a couple of these uh, former Confederate now mercenaries, uh, and then being seen with uh, uh, with these uh, European friends of his. Thank you much. Of course. If uh, if there's anything that you need to do, of course you're welcome to go do it. I'll go and uh, 
I'll go and uh, get one of my runners to go and take care of the room for you. Uh, I think that'd be good. <clears throat> I think we're good for now, actually. That sounds great. That sounds just great. And he finishes off his lemonade and uh, he walks you back out through the store. And uh, he says, and you know, I know we're all here for a purpose, but he looks up at the, towards the mountains. He says, don't forget to appreciate some of the beauty around here. Denver is a, uh, it's a great, great city. And um, gentlemen like you here, we're, we're looking to keep it that way. We're hoping to remove the one case of not so beautiful around here. That's, uh, that's good to hear. All right. You gents have a great day. He pats you both on the shoulder and goes uh, back inside. Step out of the dry goods and start packing my pipe full of the new tobacco that we just picked up. Oh, pop off a chunk of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It, uh, the chocolate is delicious. And the uh, the Georgian tobacco uh, tastes relatively, I mean, pretty fresh. So, Porter, what's bouncing around in that head of yours? Well, I'd like not to be carrying a pack around all the time, so I figure we better go get checked in. And then at some point, I'm going to head over to the Brown Palace. I guess I need to be getting me a proper coat then, huh? Well, that was the Oxford. I don't know if the Brown Palace has a dress code as such. We did spot one fine clothery. Oh, we did. I don't know if you want to be that close to the Julian, uh, in particular. Um, what is it? Okay, let me ask you this. Um, and we can maybe even try and do a little suede uh, things here. What is it that you would like to try and do and or accomplish before you get your hotel rooms? Montage. Before we get our hotel room? If there's anything more that you'd like to. I mean, because we can obviously go ahead and do all of that. Yeah, we could do the montage because we could do like what is it the uh, the the research role the, or your legwork type of thing. Um, oh, but that would be after the hotel room. Um, well, it depends. It depends if you're if you're trying to like figure out you know a number of things either like if you want to do some some research stuff on Zig, or if you wanted to like find good places to get decent clothes to get in there, or what's required in some of these, you know, the, the little cultural type things. One thing I think I would like to do, and this is just Joshua being paranoid, <laughs> is to set up a second hotel room as a fallback that the agency doesn't know about. Oh, okay. Like, we can stay in the room that they're setting up for us, but we can have a fallback to another hotel room. All right. That's easy enough to do. Let me... And yeah, I would like to also pick up a suit coat jacket-ish thing so that uh, I can get rid of the long coat but still carry and have it concealed underneath. So we want. So basically what we want to try and accomplish are a couple of things here. You want to... Get some proper clothing, get a little bit of additional safety slash backup in regards to what it is um, the agency is going to be giving you, and a little bit of the lay of the land, and a little bit of lay of land. All right. So easily, I mean, you, and you can like again, and you can use persuasion or intimidation to do this. Um, I mean, persuasion seems a bit more appropriate, and. You may also be able to. I mean, I'm I'm more than open open to listening to other potential skill uses. Porter, in that case, will see if he can get word on Zigwaller, but also he kind of wants to get the lowdown on Jasmine in general. Okay. To see if people are just talking. I mean, she's a socialite, so you think people are talking about her in some way. He kind of compares stories and that sort of thing. Okay, so all right, so let's let's actually let's break this into two separate things. Let's let's break it into a a setup role, um, and the setup involves you guys getting the things that the the physical tangible things that you need to uh, get your feet planted properly, and then we'll do one that is the. Um, uh, lay of the land type of uh, role in information, and that will break down 
um, basically how you spend the remainder of this day uh, getting everything taken care of. So now persuasion obviously is probably gonna be the skill you're going to want to use for both of these unless you can, I mean I'm open to listening to talk of intimidation to do it. Oh, I'm good with persuasion, but uh, Joshua is probably going to be a little loose-lipped and also be telling of our exploits in other places as I am making these persuasion rolls. Okay. That way I can take advantage of that whole tall tailor that tall teller that I've got. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that aspect of it would come into play better when it comes to the lay of the land uh, role. Uh, as opposed to the setup role. Um, now you you can you can spread some money around uh, to get some additional uh, or to get a bonus um, for the uh, the setup uh, as well. But I'll definitely give you a plus two on the the lay of the land role. So Porter, do you want to try setup or? Uh, yeah, I can do that because I've got all the money, so okay, it won't be that hard to lay down some money and get things figured out as needed. All right. So, yeah. So, okay. So, Porter, let's do the setup one first. So, go ahead and... So, setup's just buying supplies and stuff and getting our... It's supplies and, yeah, getting... Um, probably getting the, the backup hotel room and some discretion okay. uh, in regards to not revealing that type of information that you've got the room, those kinds of things. So, those places where money talks. This is a place where money talks. So, you can add a plus two to this as well. The room's occupied, but you don't know who's in it, right? <laughs> right. And if you want to make the argument that any of your additional skills might help with this at all, um, I'm, I'm... I I would have for lay of the land. I might have tried to work streetwise in because of uh, knowing how to associate with the uh, the shadier dealings to see if I can get information out of them about Jasmine and that sort of thing. Well, Streetwise is also for networking and interaction with the shadier. That sort of yeah, but that too. wouldn't. I don't. I don't know if that would help as much for um, setting up a hotel room and buying supplies. Um, maybe not. Well, it depends. I think that. Um, let me ask you: Are you looking to get access to any sort of supplies which might be on the gray side of legal? You see that I'm dynamite. <laughs> I don't think Porter will be grabbing any dynamite anytime soon. I do think I do think you for sure could argue that Streetwise could absolutely be used to find out which hotel is probably going to give you the best opportunity to disappear. Okay. Yeah. Something maybe a little on the seedier side. Right. The hotel that would be less likely to yeah draw attention to us. Okay. So in that sense, um, I'll give you an additional plus one uh, right. to this. So we'll go with a plus three then. It's a good thing. It's a six. Six. All right. So as far as... Benny, you, Benny. You got Bennies. You, got, you earned right. one earlier. Uh, but I don't... Just all straight re-rolls. Uh, sure, I'll re-roll. I'm going to get higher. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it was not... Agent Holt, you're really bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> we knew this going in! <laughs> <laughs> Why do they believe us? So, can I stick with the first re-roll? Or the first Absolute. roll, then? Because it's yes. better? Okay. Yes. I didn't roll a one um, on the uh, actual skill dice, so... No, that's fine. I think the only thing, the only time you can't do that is when it's a critical uh, failure. So a six. So you spread a little bit of money around. You absolutely are able to get any of the good general supplies that you might need. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, you can find a hotel uh, where, and it's really, it's really more of a, a flop house um, sort of place where the proprietor is more than happy to take your money and say, absolutely, it's yours, sir, and I don't even know who you are have a good day and give you uh, the keys to that and it's the nice part about this is too is that this particular one is tucked away in an area of town where there isn't a lot of traffic uh, going so you definitely can um, hide out there uh, should you need to do so uh, and he has a couple of large dogs uh, which uh, um, seem to help keep the place uh, secure 
So supplies wise, you're good. Now, did you want to try and secure anything that's uh, not exactly legal? I wish I could give thy, my uh, perk uh, a, a stretch here, but I have nothing in my uh, head that I need at the moment, so. All right. Yeah, the only thing that's coming to my mind is if we need to blow up a stables and destroy another giant mechanism that's inside it, some dynamite or something like that could come in handy. Um, you know, a bucket of black powder or something like that. It wouldn't even have to be dynamite. Yeah, might as well. We've used dynamite before. Why not throw it on a third town? <sighs> um, here, let's do this. I am going to flip a card. No oh, clubs. Oh, no. Oh, perfect. All right. So here's here's what happens. Complication. Yes. So club complication. We drew the jack of clubs. So here's what happens. So you are able to secure a well, yeah, we'll say we'll say a bucket of uh, black powder. I like that idea. Uh, but complication here is that it didn't go completely unnoticed. Your you may not necessarily be aware of that, but there's a good chance that somebody might have seen this. But we don't know that. We don't know that, and I would say that we're stashing that at the flop house. Absolutely. So I just led them to the flop house. Eh, it happens. <laughs> and if nothing else, at least if they, uh, you know, come flying through the door after us, we've got a bucket of black powder there. <laughs> Surprise, black powder! Boom! <laughs> That's true. Bye bye, Flop. You can house. just. Yeah, boom! So, lay of the land. Uh, so, go ahead and let's make your um, lay of the land roll here. Using the tall tailing to basically kind of talk to some people, spreading exploits to kind of, you know, grease the wheels and, and loosen them up so they can tell us about, hey, what's going on in town, blah, 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 blah. And also, would this can be considered networking with Streetwise? Uh, I think for. Yes. Yes. So both of these, well, this is going to be at plus four. Nice. <laughs> All the gossips. Wow. All right. That's a nice 14. So what do you, uh, let's go down the line. What is it that you want to know about? And I will, uh, I'll spout information. Oh, gosh. Um, just keep squeezing the GM until he keeps spitting out what you want. Yes, yes. Just ring that, ring that rock and get <laughs> as much turn up blood as we can here. Exactly. So... And, and I'm figuring, by the way, we, as you guys are doing this, the two of you are together the entire time. Oh, so, yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. So I think it might be just kind of walking. As we're doing this, we're like walking around town, just talking to some different people before getting into. That's how I envision this. So maybe there's a couple of old guys sitting in rockers outside one of the saloons, and we're just shooting the breeze and talking about you know this or that and getting a little information here and there. So one of the questions that I would like answered is um, if they know, you know, approximately how many of these Confederate mercenary soldiers are kind of wandering the town and how large is the presence of the Union soldiers in town? Because we've seen bits and pieces here and there, but, you know, how, how many of that sort of uh, number wise is in town estimate? The, uh, the the two codgers that you're that you're talking to, they they this kind of gets them on a bit of a bit of a rant, and they say that once the the war reached a ceasefire, both sides were supposed to recognize the sovereignty of the state of Colorado. Uh, that did not happen uh, officially, although they seem to. There's a bit of a disagreement between the two of them about that. So both sides keep sending their patrols and uh, uh, companies of soldiers in and out of the territory all the time. Um, so the number fluctuates quite a bit. Uh, currently, the numbers are a little on the downside for both, um, which makes them both happy. But So it varies. It varies anywhere. There's always some measure of that. Now, as far as mercenaries, yeah, they get mercenary groups and, and things like that come here all the time. Most of the time, those 
folks are just passing through on their way out to the Great Maze, uh, out in California way. However, uh, there are definitely uh, a few uh, former soldier groups or cowboy gangs uh, here in town. Um, your excellent role of a 14 nets you this information. One of them says that one of the mercenary groups here that uh, was indeed con uh, Confederate soldiers is led by a former commander known as uh, Major James Henry Lane. He's seen Mr. Lane in town himself. Major Lane, yeah, he was a Confederate uh, Confederate soldier who survived Gettysburg, uh, but then they don't know the whole details of what happened between uh, him and the Confederacy after that. But uh, Lane himself wasn't happy, so he took his men and they went uh, they went mercenary. And yeah, he said. Some weird guys got him hired out or doing something. I don't know. Some guy dressed in blue. That's all I saw. Which was kind of funny, really, when you think about it. But, uh, I mean, he's not blue like a union, but he wears a lot of blue. Anyway. Any uh, disappearances in town recently or any strange murders? Well, there's always strange things that are going on. Uh, here in town, I mean, you know, you see things going down the street. They don't have horses on them. They see things flying in the air that don't have feathers on them. So that's strange as strange as it is to me. But uh, of, of that kind of stuff, no, nothing too out of the ordinary. Oh, people good. certainly are die. People certainly die, but most of the time it's a drunken fight in the street. Somebody snuck a gun in when, when the sheriff told him not to, and there you go. Which brings me to another question. Nobody's allowed to carry guns in the town, but how hard does the law buckle down on those and how many gunfights are still in the streets? That's a good question. Uh, you do find out that it's, it's one of those situations where it's, it's only illegal if you get caught in the sense that if if it's visible if it's visible and and there are definitely and you've seen plenty of them there are deputies going around town um, if it's visible you're caught that's that's offense um, if you get caught using a gun that's a more serious offense they, they've no doubt that there certainly are people who are hiding them but uh, you know they keep them to themselves. Now you certainly can have guns uh, on within the bounds of your own property, but uh, to walk them walk around within the, the streets with them openly uh, is against the law. Are you guys gonna ask questions about Jasmine, or was there? I thought there. I thought there was. A... Well, I did. I did want to hear about Jasmine. Does this any stories or? Uh rumors or tall tales or something where I can start piecing together what exactly or who exactly I'm dealing with here. Um, you know what? Let's do a second. Let's do one second networking role in regards to Jasmine. And uh, for sure you can add the uh, streetwise. The streetwise to this. And this, that would definitely be a plus two. There we go. There we go. It's a seven. Seven. So close to a raise. Boot. I know. So close. So. I don't have blue. So I only have whites. So very, very close. All right. So um. I, that's where I am. <laughs> oh wait, 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 wait! I forgot. I have an adventure card. Go. Oh. I have extra effort. Play to add one d six to any trait roll. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. <laughs> Since this is very important to Porter, considering his uh, what he considers his future, and uh, getting strength enough to face Samuel, we'll add a oh my god a, a one to it. But with your streetwise, that does get it to an eight. That's all you need. Does get it to an eight? Yes. So you did get a raise. <laughs> all right. By the skin of your teeth. Man, these rolls have been the worst day ever. Yeah. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Here's what you learn about Jasmine. It seems, depending upon who you talk to, that she's like two sides of a coin. 
on the one side, the head side of the coin, we'll say, the side that faces most people. She is a rich socialite whose wealth comes from back out east. It's not clearly exactly known what it is that her family does, but it seems to be a variety of things from either profitable farms and plantations to uh, liquor manufacturing to just old money from overseas um, to uh, gold uh, finds as well um, or to just be close confidant to rich people and then they became rich by association. Aside from that, she travels in upper social circles, attends and has parties of extravagant natures, gets involved with business dealings, uh, even uh, is a little bit of um, has a little bit of altruism and philanthropy in helping those who are in need. Sounds like maybe she uh, she meets with people of all backgrounds, so she is a so she, um, There have been stories of her associating with. Um, a lot of the uh, Chinese who have come across um, to uh, all manner of other groups that are up and coming with um, various uh, social or power blocks of power or whatnot. So she just runs around in those circles and is part of many conversations in that regard. Uh, everyone describes her as beautiful. They describe her as very well dressed. Um, Depending upon who you ask, some are, you know, absolutely just enamored with her. Some think that she's fine, you know. Then you get to the other side of the coin, the tail side of the coin, and there's... I'm going to pick on Tom Cruise uh, slightly here. So there's like, the, there's like the Tom Cruise that is in movies and you see and stuff and he's always smiling and he just looks like he might be like a nice guy you know maybe he might be nice to hang around and talk with and maybe he can offer some good insight into things but then there's like the Scientology Tom Cruise in the in the black sweater doing the creepy laughter in those videos that get leaked and whatnot and for Jasmine it's Yep, she has these parties, but she has these parties to invite some of these poor that she uh, claims to love to help and serve, and then nobody hears from them again, and that maybe she eats them or drains their blood. Maybe she is a vampire. They did say that she came, you know, money might be from out east. There are some that say that she engages with mystical and magical arts of sorts there are some people who have said that she is attended by a number of well-dressed gentlemen who are known to be gamblers but they help her do something maybe it's maybe it's to ritualistically slaughter these poor people who come to her parties uh, she has had uh, a number of gentlemen callers who visit her and then mysteriously are never seen again. Um, now, whether or not you want to believe those, that's, that's another thing, because some of the tales get a little wild and crazy in that regard. Uh, they definitely paint her in a very uh, creepy and scary light. Just what poor means. The sun is beginning to uh, set. Uh, it's going down over the mountains, and it is, first of all, it's, it's taking your breath away, just the beauty of this orange as it's coming out over the mountains uh, and through the various peaks. Lights are starting to come on in the streets of Denver, and you're walking, making your way to the, uh, the Rocky Rest, and both of you make me a notice check. Porter's this this episode is no sponsored by the number three for Porter because yeah come on old man well I'm gonna use my first Benny for the night <gasps> all right dun 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 which is red 
Oh, nice. Ooh. Sneaking in at the end, so you can't take advantage of it. Yes. <laughs> Boom. There we go. So you're adding to that, so a total of seven. Actually, I was doing a reroll. Oh, okay. Oh, I, That'll I work. Oh, yeah, you did get a three at the beginning. Yep. So I've had a four, a 14, and now another four. Everything else agreed has been sponsored by the number three. Yes. <laughs> Here's what you notice, Joshua. The Rocky Rest is just about half a block down. And guy is going and lighting, lighting street lamps. And he lights this one street lamp and the glow expands and fills the area beneath it. And you see two gentlemen uh, talking and you can't identify one of them. He has his back to you, although his clothing looks familiar. But you see, you see the other gentleman's face uh, that he's talking to and you recognize it as H.B. Gerard. Joshua will do a double take, nudge Porter, because we're probably looking at this at the same time, and go, HB? Who? The, the guy from Lac du Parlay. Oh, HK. Oh, you're right! Yeah, well, no, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Why do you think his name is HB? Kickapoo. Kickapoo. HP? H. It was, I thought H something, sorry. Well, right, right. I, I think it's HK, isn't it? Okay, HK. Yeah, yeah. Is that him? Uh, I think so. And as you're looking, him and the man that he's talking to uh, both turn and begin walking in the opposite uh, direction uh, away from you. Is it in the direction of the... Ox. The Brown Hotel. Oh, the, uh, the Brown Palace? Yes. Um, make me a common knowledge roll, and let's see if you know. Oh, he's not going to know. Here comes a three. Here comes oh! a three. Oh, my oh! gosh. A four and a three. <laughs> yes. Did you really think the story would be over? I'm here to tell you there's a twist in the tree. Well, there's someone I never thought we'd see again. I wonder if this is a coincidence or just a random red herring. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. But first, Joshua is soon to have a fateful meeting. We'll find out about that in our next issue, Two-Face Deal. The part of Porter Holt is played by Brad Smith. Joshua Young is played by Brent Rich, and your intrepid Marshall is played by Chris Hussey. This game references the Savage Worlds game system available from Pinnacle Entertainment Group at PEGINC.com. It is unofficial media content permitted under the Media Network Content Agreement. This content is not managed, approved, or endorsed by Pinnacle Entertainment Group. And certain portions of the materials used are the intellectual property of Pinnacle, and all rights are reserved. Savage Worlds, all related settings, and unique characters, locations, logos, and trademarks are copyrights of Pinnacle Entertainment Group. Thanks also to Fear the Boot. Support their Patreon at patreon.com slash feartheboot. Intro and outro music by Half Deaf Clatch. The character of Alexander London comes courtesy of Gunslinger Andy. Molly Richards London, courtesy of Historian of Nukes. If you'd like to listen to their adventures, do some searching for The Joker's Wild Podcast. Contact information for the cast as well as music links can be found in the notes on our website, youngandholt.com. If you enjoy these issues, please consider dispensing a lovely five-star review on wherever it is you do listen from. Please search for Fear the Boot Actual Play. It's kindly appreciated. I'm Ernest Wick for the Tombstone Epitaph. And remember, 
The way some people keep secrets is simply by lowering their voice when they tell it. Fantasms.